Okay, uh, welcome guys to, to, to my talk at the uh, Kips Virtual Seminar Series. Uh, I'm today's speaker. Let's get started. So today my talk uh, is using environmental DNA to map winter hypernacular in temperate freshwater turtles. My name is Wen Shi. I'm a PhD student at Dr. Stephen Law He Lab. And this work was done at Lake Pentagon at the station. So I changed my background photo into one of the, into one of the winter uh, scenes of Lake Pentagon, which is pretty nice. Okay, so the question of my talk today, really, uh, in, in on front, is why do we care about hibernation? Why hibernation matters uh, of animals? So here are some examples of animals in their hibernation. So we have the black bears, what we call the true hibernators. Uh, they, hibern they hibernate by lowering their metabolic rate to the, to the minimum that can sustain their life and they remain physiologically inactive for the rest of the winter. Uh, then we have this amphibian rep represent representation of the gray tree frog, uh, which is super cool because they have the super cooling capacity. They can uh, lower the body temperature basically to the same of the environment. So imagine in wintertime, we can have this tiny little frog of uh, their temperature will be minus 20, minus 30 degrees uh, Celsius and they don't really get harmed because they have antifreeze uh, proteins inside the body. Okay, then we have this uh, peri rattlesnake uh, in, a, in in living in in, in in the center of the the country. They they hibernate in groups, what we call communal hibernation. Uh, typically, they have hundreds of individuals uh, uh, squeezing uh, squeeze into each other. They keep warm uh, in the way. Uh, in in the winter, they delve into the crevices of of the rocks and they stay there for the winter. But today, we're going to talk about turtles. Okay, turtles in freshwater lakes. So if one of the most important features of freshwater lakes in the region is they freeze. They, they, in most of the lake, in, in, at least in Southern Ontario, they are frozen uh, during the winter, okay? So little is known actually about turtles hibernation, hibernates under the ice, okay? Because it's blocked, you can't really see them, uh, okay? So then the question narrows down to why hibernation matters, especially for the turtles, freshwater turtles living in the northern climate. Remember, uh, in the southern Ontario, north, southern Quebec, uh, is the northern range limits of the turtles. Uh, north of uh, Otter River, there are very little turtle uh, species mm -hmm. living up north. They are, but, but we are sort of at the boundary of turtle, uh, turtle threshold, okay? Okay, so uh, let's look at a typical uh, lake in, in southern Ontario. Uh, southeastern Ontario in our region. So this is the water temperature profile of a lake from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So if we draw, so you can see the highest temperature is about 25 degrees in the winter is uh, it's around zero degrees. So if we draw a line around 15 degrees Celsius, that's where that's the temperature under which the turtles become physiologically inactive. You know, we, we know turtles are hetero, heterotherms. Uh, they, they, uh, if the environmental temperature gets lower enough, they're, they, they, they just become physiologically inactive. Okay, so if you draw a line right here, then we're looking at if we look at the proportion of uh, of a year that that the temp water temperature is lower than 15 degrees, it's a huge proportion. So sometimes it's, it's about half of a year the water temperature is lower than 15 degrees, which means for this turtle, half of a year or half of their lifetime, they're actually hibernating under the ice or on the bottom of the lake. So half of your life is not really doing much. That is a huge proportion of your life. So just, just looking at the, the time scale, just looking at the, 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 in the life history is very important, a period of, of a year that for, for the turtles, okay? On the other side, uh, in the winter, the, the, the lake freezes, okay? If the lake is frozen, we have ice on, the, on top of the water, sometimes 50 centimeters thick, and the air cannot really get into the water. Uh, as they do in the summer or autumn time, you can have gas exchange between water and air. Uh, in winter time, it's blocked by the ice. Okay, so the, the whatever oxygen turtles have will be the oxygen trapped before the ice is frozen. Okay, so turtles in general, we can group them, meat, we can separate them into two groups among the five species, five species of turtles that we have living uh, around Cubes area. Uh, in this region, we have intolerant anoxia intolerant turtles and anoxia tolerant turtles. On the left side, you can have, we have soft spiny, uh, spiny soft shells, pink paws, uh, northern map turtles. Uh, those are turtles that are 
susceptible of anoxia, anoxia situation. Anoxia means no oxygen. So if there's no oxygen in the water, even map turtles will, will live no, no more than 50 days. So after a month and a half without oxygen, they will die. That is even worse for stink pods and worse for, for spiny suction. On the other hand, we have snapping turtles and painted turtles. Uh, those two turtles, they are quite tolerant, tolerant to an oxygen situation. Without any, any oxygen supplies in the water, they can survive up to 150 days. That is, that is five months. So they can survive hibernation without any oxygen uptake from the environment. Uh, this one turtle missing here is the Blandian's turtle. We don't know exactly uh, whether Blandian's turtles are tolerant to anoxia or intolerant, but we tend to think they're uh, tolerant just based on their, their biology. Okay, with that aside, uh, so for, especially for the turtles on the left, the anoxia intolerant turtles, hibernation under the ice could be challenging, right? Because in the winter time, in the winter time if the lake is frozen, there's no way the air will get into the water which means they, they, they have to rely on whatever is left, whatever oxygen is left in the water. So if the, water, the oxygen in the water is not, is not sufficient enough, the turtles will have, very hard, have a very hard time hibernating at that spot, okay? So to sum up these two, two aspects of hibernation ecology of turtles, first, uh, the hibernation, especially in our latitudes, in the, in the northern temperate regions, it con consists of a significant proportion of the life history especially at, uh, in, in, in the range limits, okay? On the other side, hibernating under, under the water for a long period of time could be very challenging physiologically for turtles. Uh, that means turtles need to have a preferable hibernation site to survive the winter, okay? So combine these two, uh, you may argue that uh, the avail availability of preferable hibernacular may actually limit the presence of certain turtle species at a site at all which means in, in the summertime, you might have a very nice uh, marshy, swampy area for turtles. Uh, they can forage, they can, they, can, they can flourish, they can do whatever turtles would do in the summer. But just because in the wintertime, that area do not, does not provide any hibernacular options, the turtles will not live there at all. We know turtles are not very mobile species. They are not like birds. They can migrate from places to places looking for best, best places to live. Turtles typically stick to their own home range, which is limited. So, so having an ocular or hibernation site is actually very important for turtle survival or presence absence uh, in certain areas, okay? So that's, that's one part of the turtle life history that has been sort of uh, neglected for the, for the past, uh, for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for the past research, okay? So keep that in mind, we wanna look for turtles in hibernation. We wanna know where they are hibernating before we, start to protect their habitat, right? So hibernation sites could be, could be the critical habitat in the sense of conservation. So first we wanna know where they're hibernating. Uh, so the conventional methods survey for turtle hibernation sites. Uh, here I list two examples. First we can have visual search, which is very straightforward. You hire someone who is a professional that can dive under the ice, which is pretty dangerous. I, can, I, can, I cannot do that myself. Uh, I know very few people can do that. So you, you draw a hole on, 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 on the ice, then you dive into it, and you, if you're lucky enough, you can find turtles hibernating on, on, on the bottom of the lake. Uh, during hibernation, they don't really move, uh, move much, so if you see them, they are, they're gonna be there for you to, to, to observe, okay? Uh, the other way you can do indirectly uh, is to, to, put, to, to do some radio telemetry studies, so where uh, in, in autumn, in, in summer, where turtles are visible, they are active, you can trap them, uh, trap them using nets, uh, uh, using traps, then you put radio tags, tiny little radio tags on the top of their carapace. Then in the winter time, when they retreat to their hibernation site, uh, what you can do is you walk on the lake, you put on an antenna, then you can search for the radio signals uh, to, to, to sort of determine where turtles are hibernating. So it is not, it's not gonna be exact location of hibernation, uh, hibernation sites, but it will get you pretty close, right? Then you can drill a hole, then drop a camera into the, into the water and you can search for them. Okay, so those are two conventional methods that can serve a survey hibernating turtles uh, in the field. Uh, as you can already imagine, they're pretty costly and they, are, they require professional, uh, 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 professional individuals. They require a lot of work, prepar preparation work in, 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 the, in the summertime. And also they might, create, might actually create uh, uh, pressure on the turtles. So you, you might get turtles uncomfortable because you put them 
things on their characters, even though the rate attacks are typically they're pretty small, that you still can create potential stress to the turtles. Okay, so then let's think about something else. Like think, think of something that is novel, that is more, that is better, better in a way that we can detect turtles uh, using using the new technology. What we'll call here is already kind of obvious in the title is the environmental DNA. Okay? It's only uh, developing in the last decade or so, 15 years, that this method has been really, really booming in a lot of aspects of biology, ecology uh, service. And uh, before we get into the, the actual study I did, I'll just give you, I'll give you guys a little bit sphere of, uh, on, the, on the environmental DNA, okay? So if we're looking at the environment, so people start to realize that we can take a lot of, we can actually obtain a lot of information from the environment. Uh, DNAs are, DNA moleculars are everywhere, okay? So in the water, uh, in the soil, uh, in the ice, of course, and then in the sediments. So DNA, they are, they are really rarely released by anything that lives in the environment. So DNA, really, they are omnipresent. So they are, the only thing left for us to do is to obtain those information, to, to extract the DNA, and use those, those information to infer what animals have, or plants or, or lives have been living here because of just by the trace of DNA, okay? So here is the actual definition of DNA that refers to the DNA moleculars or the genetic materials, if we say that, that can be directly obtained from environmental samples. That's, uh, for example, air, soil, water, ice, et cetera, et cetera, without actually isolating the study species itself. So you don't really need to see a turtle to you, to, to, but you don't need to see a turtle, but you can just track their DNA trace to infer the turtles has to hear in, the, in, in at, at least in the past few days or, or two weeks. Okay, so we can use this eDNA samples to do a lot of things. So it's very non-invasive. So it's not invasive at all, I would argue, because all you do is you take water samples, you took air samples, you took a scoop of soil, you don't really interrupt the environment itself. So you, not, not, not to say you are not interrupting with the species you are looking at. So if you're looking at if you are studying a very a conservation species, the species of conservation concern, you want to make sure you create the minimum stress to the to the to the species. Okay, so but then uh, the environment DNA do not pose any uh, stress for 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 them at all. Okay, then the trace of the DNA actually present uh, reflects presence absence. That that is a given because if you have DNA, then the species was here. If you do not have the DNA. You can argue that the species may not be here, and potentially you can have abundance information of the species you're looking at. If you have more DNA, generally means you have more individuals or more biomass of that particular species in the detected in the region you're looking at. Okay. Okay. DNA everywhere. So that's the basically the the essential of environmental DNA. Just you have to look for them. Okay. The source of eDNA in the water, so now we narrow down our scope in just in the water. Okay? It comes from a lot of things. So everything living in the water, they, they travel through water, they leave the trace of DNA in the water. So uh, first, the big thing is the mucus. If, you, if you're looking at a fish, fish, the skin of a fish is permeable. So constantly they're releasing uh, their, their, their tissues into the water. The mucuses contain a lot of DNA of fish into the water. Uh, the skin sheds, uh, the feces, the cacaruses, Everything that you will leave in the water will will leave a signal of DNA. Okay, so the DNA signals can be highly variable depending on where you're looking at them. So if you're looking at uh, a uh, a fast flowing stream, the DNA will be will be dispersed qu fairly quickly. So one study will show that uh, if you release some DNA, excuse me, in upper stream of the stream, then you can detect that signal about. 12 kilometers downstream. So DNA will travel by the water pretty quickly. On the other side, if you're looking at a stagnant water, if you're looking at a swamp, uh, then a, a particular side that, that DNA might only reflect uh, whatever is in within maybe 10 meter radius, I'd to say. So it depends a, a lot on the characteristic of the environment, okay? And also it depends on the sample type and also depends on how much water you are, you are looking at. So it depends on a lot of things. That it's very uh, variable that is, the point I want to get. And then thus the interpretation of environmental DNA uh, should be should be taken cautiously. Okay, so so there are two scales. Spatial scale, I already mentioned if you're looking at a big lake, if you're looking at a small pond, 
uh, the interpretation of DNA results should vary, and also temporal. So DNA sometimes DNA can reflect information in the past two days, sometimes can reflect let's say say two weeks. That's sort of the, is the consensus mix maximum you can infer from a. Uh, uh, eDNA, eDNA sample. That is to say, if you take a water sample on the lake, you detect a certain species of fish, then you can say at least in the past two weeks, there's a, this species of fish in this area by looking at the DNA evidence. Okay, so then uh, in the in aquatic environments, so typical study species are fish. That is the major, major uh, target of study because apparently people love fish. Uh, uh, also frogs, amphibians, and uh, uh, yeah, invertebrates, and aquatic plants as well. Uh, not much has been paid attention to reptiles, uh, uh, reptiles, especially turtles. So that's another kind of thing. It's a merit of my study that I, I put a little effort on turtles. I mean, people love turtles, just well, probably not as much as fish, maybe. Okay, uh, so next time you, if you go to a lake, uh, you look at the fish, you look at the frog, you look at the snake, uh, Daphnia, the little invertebrates live in the water, they, you might think, you might see things differently. They all leave DNA into the water. The, the water, as much as clear you can see it, actually contains a lot, a lot of information that you can, you can dig, okay? So before we get into more details, so there are another, there's a the concept of DNA studies I want to kind of point it out. So we have two ways of analyzing DNA and uh, samples. So first way, we have the species-specific detection. So here we have a tube that contains the DNA, uh, DNA materials that we extracted from the environmental samples. We have a lot of fragments. We have, uh, they come from different species. So one, one way to look at it is we're looking only looking at one species or two species uh, that we are interested. So they are very, very specific. Then we develop as this targeted only uh, that, spe that species. So this assay will, will not pick up any other signal. If they are any fish, they are frogs, they are snakes, but we are only looking at turtles. So this assay will, will actually narrow it down to the species level. We can not only, not only distinguish turtles from fish, we can also distinguish thing pods from map turtles. So that's the very species specific. We can get down to the species level. Okay. It's very useful for invasive species monitoring because in the early stage uh, of, of invasion, the, the, the individuals of individ invasive species tend to be very low. Okay. So conventional methods maybe, maybe have a hard time finding them, but DNA signals can reveal their presence absence early than your conventional surveys. So that has been proven in, in Chicago uh, waterways by the, the they, are, they have a, they have a Asian carp monitoring program using level DNA. They actually found EDN evidence is two weeks before they actually caught the fish. Okay. Then also the same goes with the study of species of conservation concern because those species tend to be rare uh, in nature. So this 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 technology is really good uh, looking for them, especially uh, for example the, the eastern hellbenders in the States, they they are they are, they're rare, they're not easy to find. So they can just take a water uh, from the environment that they infer whether, whether, whether the salamander uh, is in the area or not, okay? On the other side, we can have a broader range uh, detection. So in this case, we have a community level uh, meta eDNA metabarcoding survey. So where we target an array of species, not, not just one or two species, where we are looking at hundreds, even thousands of species at the same time. Let's say all fishes, all, all vertebrates in the water, uh, that, that is also doable. So that is achieved by uh, what we call next-gen sequencing. Uh, it's a fancy, fancy technique. We call them next-gen sequencing. It's actually already this generation sequencing. People are using this uh, as a, more or less as a conventional sequencing uh, technology. So what you can do, you can de develop a more general assay that, that can grab a lot of, uh, we, we can grab a group of species and have, have something in common. Let's say all the fish. They, we, we can grab all the fish sequences at once. We can sequence all of them. Then we'll put in an array that we can dis dis distinguish different species uh, in, in, the, in, in, in the sample pool, okay? So we can do a lot of biodiversity survey at community, community level. You can basically looking at the cup of water and just tell from this, wa this water sample, we can say uh, we have 15 species of fish, two species of turtles, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the area. 
but the, the, the sort of the issue or the, the, the drawbacks of this way of serving is first is, is more expensive and also they they have less resolution so a lot of times you can't really get down to species level uh, let's say you can get to genus level or family level or even 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 more uh, even more coarse uh, results you can have a general idea but you don't have very specific uh, results so in our case we're using the uh, species specific EDN detection because we are looking at one particular turtle species that is hibernating in Lake Penica. Okay. So to sum up, we have the definition of November DNA. Now we're going to use the DNA to detect turtle species in hibernation. So before, before that, so we have a very important kind of argument, or even the form of my hypothesis in this study is the detectability of because of the detectability of eDNA signal is greatly affected by DNA dispersion and degradation. So in terms of dispersion, if you have a fast flowing water, you have a stack of water, and also you have a fast moving organism, you have a slow moving organism. So that makes a lot of differences. And also water mixing. In the summertime, the water is mixing because of the wind. Uh, in the winter, the water is not actually mixing as much because the ice is covering uh, the lake and also degradation temperature high, higher uh, gets higher than dna would will break faster and also if you have stronger uv light radiation uh, the, the dna will degrade faster so in our case if we're going to apply dna edna technology in the frozen lake in the winter time a lot of things have actually been simplified so we are not actually worrying looking at all this variable that might affect might affect our interpretation of the edna detection. First of all, uh, first of all, turtles during hibernation, they are not really moving. They typically stay at one spot for the entire hibernation. So the mobility is limited. Water mix, mixing is limited, as I mentioned. Degradation, yes, the temperature is lower. It's, it's close to zero degrees, which is pretty good for, for DNA preservation. And UV light is blocked by the ice. So we're looking at a very simplified situation of environment DNA studies when the lake is frozen. And also the animal of our study is not really moving. So imagine in a lake that is frozen, you will have turtles hibernating underneath. They're constantly releasing DNA into the lake as a fixed station of, of, of the DNA source. Then if you look, if you are surveying the entire lake, you, 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 you will argue that the DNA signals across the lake may actually reflect something about the, DNA, the turtle hibernation site uh, under the X. Okay, so then the question uh, becomes very simple and clear. Will eDNA signals in a frozen lake review the distribution of a hibernating turtles? So uh, does the pattern of eDNA signals across the lake match with the pattern of hibernating turtles under the X? So this, to answer this question, our study species uh, is the northern map turtle. So this is the mid-sized turtle commonly in the area. So if you are an outdoor person, uh, you, 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 you go, uh, go to a lake, you would normally see the turtle basking on a rock, on a rock or on a log, uh, here showing the picture of map turtles in the wintertime. So they hibernate uh, late October to early April. So about five months of, their, of the year will be hibernating. So half of the life hibernating. And also they are known to hibernate in large groups, what we call communal hibernation. So in large aggregations, sometimes you can have hundreds of uh, map turtle individuals hugging in the same area, hibernating. So it's very, very concentrated. And also there are evidence showing that they're pretty loyal to, 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 to their hibernation size, which means they go back every year. So year after year, the population will go back to the same spot, hibernating. So it's a pretty stable ground for hibernation. And as I mentioned before, they are intolerant to prolonged anoxia conditions. Uh, if I remember correctly, that is less than 50 days. So if the if the lake they are they are hibernating, they do not provide enough oxygen for for the winter. That the map turtle will simply not be there hibernating, or not even be there in the summer because they can't be they can't they have nowhere to go in the winter. Okay. So here is the study site. It's the Lake of Pentagon. I'm I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Uh, cubes is right here. This is the lake. Uh, we have a fairly deep, relatively deep. Uh, central basin in uh, in the center of the lake is about 10 to 12 meters. Then we have shallower areas towards the end. Okay, so we do know map turtles are 
are doing pretty well in the lake. Uh, uh, we have established population of about 1,500 adult individuals of map turtles in the lake. It's actually one of the largest uh, pop northern map turtle population in East North America. And it has been continuously monitored by one of our colleagues, uh, Greg Bote, uh, who has been monitoring this, uh, this, this population of map turtles since his PhD uh, back in the 20, uh, early, early 2000s. So we do, do know a lot of things about these turtles uh, in the lake. Especially we know that turtles are hibernating at one site, uh, one particular area of the lake that has been uh, repeatedly confirmed uh, during, during the winter service. So we know turtles are hibernating at that, at that spot. And also we do know another place we know turtles, we, we think turtles are hibernating, but we never get confirmed. Because in, in, in the springtime, early spring, very early spring, early April when ice just is gone, uh, you will see turtles basking at that site. So you, you would, you, you would hypothesize that the turtles will not be too far away from the hibernation site because it's very hard for turtles coming out of hibernation to travel across the entire lake uh, to, uh, to, to bask on a rock. They will, they will choose somewhere that is close to the hibernation site. So we think there's one spot turtles are hibernating, but we never get confirmed. You know, Lake Pentagon is a pretty big lake. It, it, it's gonna be hard and very exhausted exhausting to find all the turtles happen, okay? So that's the information we have for the, for the lake. Now, now comes to the, to the part that we're using environment DNA to confirm first the no hibernation site and also to, to survey the suspected hibernation site, okay? So here is the impression of the winter in Lake Apenicum. This is the, one of the images from Landsat, the, the satellite uh, doing geo, geological surveys over the years. So in the winter, you can see the entire lake is almost frozen. Most of the lake is frozen, it's except for the area that is close to Chaffee's Lock, the Davis Lock, because we do have flowing waters in the area. So the, the lake there will be the part of that, the part of that part of the lake is less likely to, to, to be frozen. But the entire lake, most of the lake is, is frozen. Okay. Sometimes the, the ice can get up to uh, 50 centimeters high, uh, thick. Okay, more details on the water sampling scheme I did, uh, we did. So we have two winter seasons, so 2017 winter and 2018 winter, two winters. Altogether, we have 121 samples. Uh, each sample will contain one liter of water taken below the ice. Uh, then the water was filtered on site using a, a pump, uh, pretty heavy and pretty sturdy uh, under that circumstance because you are doing uh, on-site filtration in, in very low temperature. Uh, we filter the water into a, 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 through a, a filter paper that is very fine pore size. So we have my, one micron pore size, it's pretty fine filter paper. So in that way, uh, everything in the water, the materials in the water, DNA in the water will be trapped on, on the paper. Okay, so then we extract DNA from the paper. So that, that just, uh, we process the water sample. So filtration, extraction, then DNA was extracted and then analyzed by what I mentioned, the species specific uh, uh, assays that is targeted directly or solely on the uh, geographic, uh, sorry, uh, northern map turtles. So we have five species of turtles in the lake, but this assay will only pick up that one particular species, will not mistakenly take other uh, turtle species signals, okay? So here's the breakdown of my sample scheme. I did it in two winters. The first winter, the first day, uh, uh, first day I took, we took uh, 30, 36 samples across the lake, more or less evenly, uh, about 400 meters uh, uh, apart. I, I didn't go beyond this spot is because uh, the lake at the time was not, was not frozen because of the, the Rideau Rido Canal. Uh, I did this, this, uh, this, this patch of sample sampling as a test because at the time I was sampling, I did not know anything about map turtles. Uh, to the matter of fact, I was looking for the other, the other species of turtles. So I didn't know. And so thus I took all the samples without any bias. So this actually later served as, as a blind test of the technology. So of eDNA e technique. So what I did is I took all the samples, I analyzed the samples, I, I pointed out where I, I, I have positive signals. Then I consult with the expert, Greg Volte, uh, who know turtles are hibernating where, then we compare data and see whether, whether this, this is true at all. If, if sort of as a preliminary study that whether eDNA can be applied in this situation 
in the first place. Okay. In the second winter after the confirmation and consult consulting process, I took another 86, 80, 85 samples across the lake with a more focus on now, now I know where turtles are hibernating because Greg told me. I know turtles are hibernating right here. And then we know turtles are suspected to hibernate at this corner. So I took more, a lot of more samples at those two sites. And also I took another transect across the central basin uh, to give more coverage and also along the shoreline. Okay. We need a more breakdown of the sample scheme quickly. Uh, so this is the first year, uh, 36 samples without actually, without any prior knowledge. Here's the transect across the central basin. Here are the more samples across Lake, uh, Lake uh, a Acre Island. Apparently the, the area of the, the, the island is eight acre. And also I, I did two transects at where turtles are hibernating and also confirmed by that visual search. We, we did, we drew, I, we drew a hole, we drop a camera, we see turtles are hibernating on, on the floor. Then we did the transect uh, to uh, away, uh, further away from, sorry, distant away from, from, the, uh, from, from the, the site. Then we are hoping maybe the DNA will get less likely to be detected because we are getting further from the hibernation site. Then I took more an, another nine samples at a site where we think turtles are are suspicious. We suspected turtles are hibernating around around this area. Okay. So then my predictions uh, of the study is that uh, two parts. First part is the spatial pattern of eDNA signals will match the distribution of hibernating turtles in the lake, which means if particular spot turtles are hibernating under the ice, I will detect DNA signals on top of the turtles. If there's no turtle, I should not detect any DNA signals. Okay, on top of that, I will predict the content of target DNA should be higher at the sites that is closer to known or suspected hibernation sites. So if you're getting closer, you'll get higher DNA. You get further, you get less DNA. Okay, those are my two predictions. Then here are the results. So this is the overall result. So among all the sites, you can see the blue, the black dots are non-detections. The red dots are detections. So we have a lot of detections across the, around the island where we know turtles are hibernating. We have some detection at the suspected hibernation site. And we have a lot of non-detection at the other area of the lake, in areas of the lake. Okay, to further break down the results. First year I took, I did two detect, I did I found two positive signals. One is near the island. One is near the suspected site. Although this is pretty coarse, it's only had 36 samples. It's pretty uh, sparse from uh, uh, from each other across the lake. I consulted with Greg Bota. I get pretty excited because not only I have one detection, uh, uh, one detection near the lake where turtles are hibernating, and also I have one detection where turtles are suspected to hibernate. So. That's pretty pretty exciting, pretty, pretty exciting for, both for me on the on the environmental DNA perspective, perspective, and also on on Greg's perspective because he thinks turtles hibernating, but we never get confirmed. But the DNA signal suggests that turtles may actually hibernating over there. Okay, this is the the transect across the the central basin. Here are two transects across the turtles are hibernating right here, right here. Then we have a mosaic detection non-detections in the trance. So I'll explain this a little bit later. And also I have another detection. We have another detection at the site we think sort of hibernating, okay? To further, uh, to further analyze the sites near the AAK Island where turtles are known to hibernate, we sus sub uh, subset this part, of, this part of sites. We calculate the distance between each site to the nearest shore to the island. We, then we did a, so uh, the bigger dots will be detections. The smaller dots will be non-detections. Then we did a very simple logistic model that showing that uh, the detection probability diminishes along the distance. So which means further, further away you get from the, from the site, uh, from sort of the hibernating, the less likely you will get any detections. So one thing I do want to mention here to further explain the results is we were expecting that uh, uh, you will have higher DNA, DNA content near the shore, then DNA will get lower and lower in, in concentration along, <coughs> excuse me, away from the shore. But unfortunately, uh, we didn't get that pattern. Instead, 
we, we found that we have higher probability of detection along uh, closer to the shoreline and lower probability of detection away from the shoreline. So instead of a quantity relationship along the distances, distances we have a probability relationship along distances. Know here that even at where turtles are happening in zero meters, turtles are happening underneath, we have 50% of detection probability. So it's not 100%. It's not, it's not saying that we have turtles underneath our 100%, 100% time to detect DNA signals. So 50% probability might seem low to some of the folks out there, but from, from a field biologist perspective, if you have a technology that can give you 50% of probability of detection, that is pretty nice, which means I can, I can just repeat five times and get a very reasonable and very confident result. Okay? So 50% detection probability from where turtles are happening all the way to 600 meters where you fail to detect anything beyond that range. So if you took a sample across the frozen lake, you have a signal. That means in a radius about 500 meters, you might have a turtle or a group of turtle hibernating in the area. Okay. So to jump into the quick, quick conclusion of the study, uh, the eDNA signal generally match with a no and suspected hibernation site of northern map turtles in the lake. Uh, instead of detecting a concentration gradient along the transects, we detected we determine a decrease in detection probability along a transect ex extending from the known hibernation site. Okay, so, so the part of detection probability, I, I kind of already argued that 50% of detection probability is not too bad. And also think of that this, this technology is not, it's not a direct detection uh, survey methods compared to visual search. If you see the turtle, you see the turtle, the turtle is there. If you see a DNA, if you detect DNA signal, you can infer the turtles are here. So imagine you go, if you go to a lake of any, without any known knowledge of turtle hibernation, right? You, if you go there, the best way in our case, in, coming from this study is you can do a very rough survey of eDNA across the lake. If you have a positive signal, you basically narrow down your further search to a proportion of the lake. Instead of visually searching, diving the entire lake, now you can just use eDNA to give you guys to give you a better idea where turtles might be hibernating. Then you can do a further detailed search. So that sort of that comes out come, comes out as a merit of the study that you can use very simple methods. You take a water, cup of water under the ice, and just take look at the water, right? Analyze what's in it, and just give you a a relatively good indication of presence absence of certain species you're looking at. Not only turtles, you can looking at fish. Uh, for the people who love winter fishing out there, you can looking at mud puppies. Uh, it's a salamander. We know basically nothing about them during winter. We can look at a lot of things. Then DNA is everywhere about everything. So it's a huge, huge resources out there that we can utilize to answer a lot of questions. Okay. I will not end my talk there because all the talking is kind of boring. I do have videos for you guys because I know people love videos and people like see things. I, I like to, that's why I did. I asked my supervisor to, to provide more fun for the study. Actually, he's a fan of that as well. So he purchased, uh, we purchased uh, this uh, underwater survey robot. It's, it's a drone with a front facing camera. We have this uh, trident drone that we can drop into the water, which will drill a hole on the ice, of course. Then we drop the trident into the water. Then we can drive the, we can use a, joy, a joystick type of controller and drive the drone towards wherever we want to go. Then we can search for the turtle with our own eyes. We can see them where we think they're hibernating and we suspect they're hibernating. Okay, just add more fun to the study. So the setup, uh, oops, setup is right here. So we have the drone right here. We draw ice, uh, draw a hole on the ice with the, uh, with the auger. Then we have the, the drone is tethered. So it's not like a, a remotely controlled because uh, the, 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 the signal cannot transfer uh, on or the, on, in the water under the ice, that's just uh, physics. Okay, so it's tethered to a 30 meter, tether to the router. So th this can go in the radius of 30 meters. The tether will transmit signals to, 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 a, to a controller. Then you can use the controller to drive the drone wherever you want in the radius. Okay, so the search pattern is right, something like this. You have the shore uh, because we know from the biology of the turtle that the map turtle tend to uh, hibernate near the shorelines. 
So we find a shore that we think turtles are hibernating. Then we find a spot. Then we drop the drone at that spot. We drive the drone towards the shore. Then we do this uh, along the shore pattern of search, looking for turtles. Okay. So I'm going to show you two video clips. The first clip is first clip is the is at where we know turtles are hibernating. So in this area, uh, the estimation is hundreds of map turtles are hibernating. So we can see two females and one male. The male in the winter will actually guard their potential mate in the springtime. So females are more less mobile, and the, the males will actually uh, cruise around a little bit around the females. They, he wants to secure that he will get to mate once the ice is gone. Okay. So that's the first dive I have using the draw. Now immediately you can see the turtles hibernating under, under the bottom. Okay. So that's not too exciting. We know turtles are hibernating. The real exciting uh, thing for this project for me is this one. So this is site we think turtles are hibernating. We suspected turtles are hibernating, but never get confirmed. So I was searching two weeks, uh, two weeks in a row and looking for any evidence of having uh, hibernating turtles. You can see the rocky shore is fairly shallow. And then you can see there's a turtle. I was too I was too I was pretty excited because that's the first time you see them and because previously you only have their the visuals. So you only have the DNA detections, you have myth, you have legends that they are there, but then boom, they're actually actually they are hibernating. So we, we see them, we see them with our eyes. Okay, everything get confirmed. The story has a heavy ending, I guess. Okay, so with that, uh, I, I, I would like to thank all the people that provided a lot of help for this, uh, for this, for this project. First, the committee members of my, my PhD study, Dr. Brian Cumming and Dr. Yushan Wong, provide a lot of valuable uh, suggestions and insights. Cube stuff, big, big shout out to them, Aaron Zagato and Sonia Nubreka, the, the managers of the, the station that provide a lot of logistic uh, help to the study and also uh, the field work help from the volunteers and all support from all the members from Lawhi Lab. Uh, I guess I can't really answer any questions from the audience, but uh, I'll, I'll, happy, I'll be more than happy to, to answer your, your further inquiries uh, via email. I have my, my email address right here on the, on the, on the corner. Feel free to send me emails about turtles uh, in general, or if you want to chat anything about aquatic life, that would that would be great. And uh, yeah, uh, that that's that's for the talk. And thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time.